I've got a, a diverse group of people here in the room, but I'm speaking first and foremost to my students tonight. Uh, all last semester, the first year students presented the work that they made before they came here, so I thought I would reciprocate and begin by showing some paintings that I made before I <laughs> went to grad school. <clears throat> so time travel back to 1989, uh, people were debating uh, whether or not uh, the Supreme Court should have uh, struck down laws banning desecration of the American flag. 1990, we had just invaded uh, Panama to oust Manuel Noriega. And then I uh, went to graduate school in San Diego. And while I was there, I was very influenced by, among others, Alan Capro, who was a professor there and one of my mentors. And what, what struck me about Alan's ideas, is that he, he's probably best known uh, for his happenings, but he, his, sort of his big idea was the blurring of art and life. Those are the words he used. The idea that art wasn't only something that happened when you removed yourself from the world, but that it could be a process of engagement with the world that art could be a social process, that it could involve collaboration, that it could happen in public. And so during my years at UCSD, I experimented with a lot of different ways of engaging the public. Here I am handing out flyers in downtown Santa Barbara for a sit-in demonstration against the tide, and uh, also rehearsing for this demonstration against the tide with some of my friends, Nina Cachadorian in the background, some of whose work you may know. Roman DeSalvo, I'm there in the middle, and Olaf Westfallen in the foreground. And then here we are after drawing our line in the sand, and the tide was not, was not convinced. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is my MFA thesis project, a uh, collaboration with Nina Cachadorian and Stephen Matheson called Car Park. I was invited by the curator of the gallery at Southwestern College a two-year community college in the town of Chula Vista, which is right on the Mexican border, the southernmost town, one of the southernmost towns in San Diego. And when we, I invited Nina and Stephen to collaborate with me, and when we visited the campus, what we were most struck by was the parking lots. As you can see from this aerial photograph, the campus, which is composed of these white-roofed buildings in the center, is surrounded by a ring of parking lots for about 3,500 cars. Now I'm going to show you a video. I got you. <laughs> if you drove by Southwestern College in Chula Vista today, you might have thought you were seeing things. You were. Cars parked according to color in the lots there <laughs> today. More than 3,000 cars. The project was a work of art sponsored by the college's art gallery and organized by three local artists. Drivers were directed to the correct lot by color coordinators as they arrived this morning. The artists did their homework ahead of time, counting cars and tallying colors to figure out how much room to make for each color. Hi, can I help you? Okay, you're gonna go to the beige parking lot. It's right up here. The beige? In the, yeah, you're gonna go to beige. And it's the D parking lot. It's like three parking lots. We've actually taken a place that people don't think about spending time, which is a parking lot, somewhere very boring, somewhere you try to avoid, and turned it into a place which might be somewhere to go and actually take a look at what's there. Separating out the colors involves a lot of cooperation on the part of people, and there we kind of get into things like, you know, it's sort of a social experiment. Beige is a color that has many variations. People have been wonderfully cooperative, occasionally a red car has popped in and we've been told don't resist people too much, persuade them, but if they insist parking a red car in a beige lot, go ahead. It'll stand out like a sore, like a boil on a finger. Interesting. I'm awaiting the outcome to see what it's going to be. Why are you in this lot? <clears throat> because they don't have any purple, and the closest thing they could come up with is electric 
blue. Are you offended? Not at all. You like being electric blue? No, I like being purple. Hi. Hi. What do you think about this? I think it looks pretty good. Hi, what do you think about this? Uh, it's really nice. Hi, what do you guys so, think So, you know, I just, I love the idea, thank you, I love the idea that that art could be anything, that it could happen anywhere, that it wasn't something that was limited to my studio, that I didn't have to retreat from the world and, and reflect on it, but that I could go out and engage in it through my artistic practice. And then the internet happened. Um, I was convinced uh, around this time that the internet was going to be a, a big thing and that it would become a place in which artists could, could do, could stage interventions, could, could make art. Um, it was a, a very exciting time. There was a lot of naive techno-utopian fantasies about the dawning of cyberspace. Um, and to some extent, I, I think I bought some of those, those dreams. Uh, I moved to Berlin right after finishing my uh, MFA at UC San Diego, and uh, quickly met other artists who were interested in this new terrain, what we were starting to call new media art, and was invited to make a, what we now would call a net art project, but I don't think we quite had a name for it at the time. Um, invited to do a net art project for computer-aided curating, which was, I, I believe, the first online venue for net-based art um, or web-based art. And I'm going to see if I can launch it. Uh, so yeah, this, this project um, went online in 1995. Uh, it was one of the first net-based or web-based art projects. And uh, for many years, it didn't work. I made it using a kind of HTML that is no longer supported by contemporary browsers. But last week, with the help of Chris Martino, who's a student in our program, uh, we brought it back to life. And I'm happy to be able to demonstrate it again. So I, I rode around central Berlin on my bicycle with an Apple QuickTake. It was the first consumer digital camera. And took digital snapshots of the construction sites that I found. It, it occurred to me that the internet was a kind of nascent urban space. And everywhere you turned at that time, websites had these under construction banners. And that Berlin was also this urban space that was under construction. So this is a very simple attempt to map the cartographic level of this, this picture onto the geographical level and the, pic the pictorial level of uh, photography. So I'm just going to show you some of my favorite pictures from this project. And uh, it's actually going to be exhibited in a museum for the first time next fall at the Montclair Museum of Art. It's one of my favorites. This is rebar, the steel bars that they use before they pour the concrete. Can you all hear me OK in the back? Is, is the loud enough? All right, so I'm living in Berlin, fresh out of grad school. and meeting all these interesting artists from all over the world who are flocking to new media from different backgrounds, painting, performance, conceptual art, photography, you know, political art. And it occurred to me that we could really use a place to exchange information and ideas. Um, and so I just sort of went ahead and made one. Um, rhizome, which is a botanical term, for a system of horizontal roots that extends underground and sends up shoots, uh, a term that's used metaphorically by Deleuze and Guattari, these uh, French post-structuralist kind of anti-philosophers, I suppose, um, as a metaphor for non-hierarchical, horizontally distributed networks of all kinds. I decided to call this, this platform rhizome because I really wanted it to be kind of like art forms stood on its head a really like a bottom-up grassroots communication platform where anybody could, could talk to anybody, uh, a kind of art world meritocracy. So I, I started an email list and then started archiving the contents of the conversation in a database and made the database accessible via the web, a very kind of early example of community-generated content.
which is now, you know, with Web 2.0, uh, very, very common. While running Rhizome, um, I made a, a net art project. Rhizome was, was all consuming for me, I have to admit. I didn't make much art during the seven years that I was, you know, building and running what became a nonprofit organization. Um, but I did do this project, collaborating with Alexander Galloway and Martin Wattenberg. It's a, a data visualization and an interface to the library of text that people had submitted to Rhizome over its first three years. So there are about a thousand texts in the, in the library at this point. And every time somebody posted a new article, um, a pixel would appear on this screen. It's a Java applet, technically speaking. And then when that article, when somebody read the article, it, that pixel would get a little bit brighter and a little bit bigger. And over time, the popular articles became bright stars. Uh, and if you clicked on a star, it would draw a constellation linking it to all the other stars that shared the same keyword. So this is the NetArt constellation, linking together all the stars that have been tagged with the word NetArt, or the, the tag NetArt. And then if you clicked again on the star, you could read the text. So kind of an early example of, of uh, web-based data visualization art. Rhizome grew and grew and completely took over my life. Um, in addition to the online conversation, we started archiving works of art in what has become the largest archive of new media art or art that engages with emerging technologies exhibitions, events, commissions, where we give money to artists to make projects. I ran Rhizome full-time from 96 through 2003, and since then I've been on the board and teaching and making art. This is what Rhizome looks like now. Um, in 2003, when I stepped away, we formed uh, an affiliation with the New Museum of Contemporary Art, so since then Rhizome has been kind of like an organization in residence there. Um, Financially independent, but uh, embedded, and uh, lots of opportunities for collaboration on public programs, exhibitions, and events, and things like that. But you know, so for me, uh, Rhizome was also kind of a social sculpture. That's a term coined by Joseph Boyce uh, to refer to a kind of artistic practice, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing very loosely. Uh, in which social space is, in fact, the material. Um, and I saw this, in a way, as an extension of the kind of work I was doing in the parking lots of Chula Vista, California. So moving forward uh, from 2003, when I stepped away from Rhizome, uh, I was teaching uh, full-time at Brown University at this point, and um, Increasingly uh, struck by how, how little protest I saw in the United States against the war in Iraq, which had been going on at this point for three years and was getting really bloody, and how ineffectual the protests that were taking place seemed to be. So as some of you may remember, in, in the spring of 2003, right before the coalition, uh, before the US invaded Iraq, there were massive protests, massive marches all over the world. According to the BBC, whose estimates are pretty conservative, there were over 10 million people marching simultaneously in you know, London and Paris and New York um, and many, many other cities. Uh, apparently the largest coordinated protests uh, in the world to date at that point. And it seemed like nobody even blinked. Right? It seemed like the, the tactics and strategies that we had learned uh, in the 1960s when there was, you know, so many uh, important protest movements. It, it seems like they had become rather ineffectual. Here's a photo that I found online of some Brown students actually um, getting arrested after staging a civil disobedience action at the Army recruitment office in downtown Providence. And this is a photo taken the same day of one of my students, actually, uh, Quint Stevenson, a RISD sculptor, getting his MFA. He's holding up the sign in the background that says, hey, hippie, shut up. Nobody likes the war. 
And you know, <laughs> despite Quint's cynicism, I think he was kind of right. Um, he was pointing to the seeming futility of traditional forms of protest in you know, this post 9-11 era. And I, I didn't have any solutions, I didn't have any answers, um, but I was really curious about it and I was troubled. And I, I began a project um, that was my way of exploring uh, this question of what had changed uh, in terms of how we perform our politics in public uh, in the 40 years since 1968. And now I'll play another video. My dear friends of peace and freedom, I come to New York today with a strong feeling that my dearly beloved husband, who was snatched suddenly from our midst slightly more than three weeks ago now, would have wanted me to be present today. You who will not be deluded by the talk of peace, but who press on in the knowledge that the work of peacemaking must continue until the last gun is silent. I come to you in my grief only because you keep alive the work and dreams for which my husband gave his life. We must now turn our attention and the sole force of the movement to the problems of the poor here at home. My husband always saw the problem of racism and poverty here at home and militarism abroad as two sides of the same coin. In fact, it's very clear that our policy at home is to try to solve social problems through military means. We who commit civil disobedience, we're disturbed too. And we need to disturb those who are in charge of the war. Because the president, by his lies, is trying to create an air of calm and tranquility in people's minds. When there is no calm and tranquility in Southeast Asia, and we mustn't let people Forget that. The people who commit civil disobedience are engaging in the most petty of disorders in order to protest against mass murder. These people are violating the most petty of laws, trespass laws and traffic laws, in order to protest against the government's violation of the most holy of laws, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, we need to do something to disturb that calm, smiling, murderous president in the White House. The incredible war in Vietnam has provided the razor, the terrible, sharp cutting edge that has finally severed the last vestige of the illusion that morality and decency are the guiding principles of our foreign policy. But perhaps, perhaps what the president means when he speaks of freedom, is the freedom of the American people. But what has this war done for freedom in America? It has led to even more vigorous governmental efforts to control information, to manipulate the press, and to pressure and persuade the public through distorted or downright dishonest documents. The president mocks freedom if he says that this is a war to defend the freedom of the Vietnamese. Perhaps 
The only freedom this war represents is the freedom of the war hawks in the Pentagon and in the State Department to experiment with counterinsurgency and guerrilla warfare in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this meeting. It's been hard for me and the farm workers. We have been so absorbed in our own struggles that we have not participated in an active way in the battle against the war. So we must work every day, week after week, month after month, year after year if necessary, outlasting the opposition, using time to defeat them. That is what it takes to bring change in America today. Nothing less than disciplined, organized, nonviolent action every day will challenge the power of the corporations and the generals. But people have to decide to do it. Individuals have to decide to give their lives over to the struggle for specific and meaningful social change. And as they do that, others will follow. Their children will follow. The young will follow. And if we offer the young an alternative out of the energies and resources of our own lives, perhaps fewer and fewer of them will seek their manhood in affluence and war. It's up to each one of us. And it won't work unless we use our own lives to show the way. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Si se puede, si se puede, si se puede, si se puede, si se puede. Otro mundo es posible. Chavez vive. Yeah, um... I just like to say that that I like being called sister much more than professor. Now, there has been a lot of debate in the left sector of the anti-war movement as to what the orientation of that movement ought to be. And I think that there are two main issues at hand. One group of people feels that that movement the anti-war movement ought to be a single issue movement, the cessation of the war in Vietnam. They don't want to relate it to any other forms or kinds of oppression taking place in this country. There is another group of people who say that we have to make those connections. We have to talk about what's happening in Vietnam as being a symptom of something that is happening all over the world, as something that is happening here in this country. You know, Nixon made a speech on November 3rd, I think it was, and he said something that we all ought to pay attention to, we all ought to take heed of. He said, understand, the Vietnamese cannot defeat or humiliate the U.S. government. Only Americans can do that. And I feel that it is our responsibility to humiliate and to defeat the United States government and all of the fascist tactics it is using to oppress liberation fighters in this country. Thank you very much.
Those who profess to favor freedom, yet deprecate agitation, are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its waters. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. See, we have not only the right to speak out, we have an obligation. We must be involved. We must fight racism in all of its manifestations. We must also look truthfully at this land of the free and home of the brave. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written and let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. All right, so what, I, what I'm thinking about as this project unfolds over about three years is, is really what's changed. You know, it, we, as I was you know, listening with, with the audience to these rousing uh, and in many cases brilliant speeches, it was, you know, I was wondering what, what are we applauding for? You know, what, what's the, are we applauding the strength of the actor's performance? Are we applauding in solidarity with a 40-year-old you know, uh, radical movement? Or is, are we doing some kind of real-time transposition, um, you know, hearing the word Vietnam and, and thinking about Iraq, for example? War hawks in the Pentagon could just as well uh, refer to you know, George Bush as uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, so hard at the same time to imagine for, for us, I think, in 2008, what it would be like to be part of a massive social movement that really believed they were on the cusp of revolution. Revolution seems almost impossible today. And it seemed to me that somehow part of that shift was the change from a time when there were three monolithic media networks to a time when everybody has cameras and everyone has their own channel on YouTube and uh, the whole media environment has transformed so much. So this is sort of where my interest is going now is at this sort of stage in, in my work is to you know how what is the relationship between how we perform ourselves in public and particularly how we perform ourselves politically and the ways in which those performances are represented and mediated and distributed um, through uh, media technologies uh, like cell phones and YouTube. So in 2010, I began to turn my attention to contemporary protests, particularly the protests that were happening around the world and in North America in the wake of, our, uh, of the catastrophe of September 11th and a new uh, rise um, under the Patriot Act of heavily policed protest. Um, there were you know, so many conflicts taking place um, between police and protesters on streets all over the world, and it seems like the it seemed like the relationship between police and protest was changing, and that it, uh, as I collected video footage of these interactions, I was struck by how ritualized they were, how theatrical they were. So I, I decided to basically make an informal archive of video clips documenting interactions between police and protesters in the U.S in the years following September 11th, between 2002 and 2010. And, um, and then have exhibited excerpts from this archive, clips from this archive um, in several ways. Uh, first at the De Cordova Biennial at the De Cordova Museum in Massachusetts, where I was invited to show my work in their photography study space. And at first I thought that it was a very unfortunate choice on the part of the curators. Um, but then I found a way to take advantage of it. The 
so I'm projecting video from inside onto the glass doors of this gallery, having frosted them so that they function as a rear projection screen. You're really only seeing a kind of narrow vertical slice of the whole video image. So there's already this kind of censorship going on. Not censorship, but occlusion, I suppose. So I, I shot a bunch of the footage myself. I collected it from protesters, from indie media journalists, and also um, I got my hands on quite a bit of police footage uh, via lawyers who represented activists when they were suing police departments for violating their civil rights or defending themselves if the police decided to press charges. So when a visitor to the gallery has the temerity to open the door, um, a system of sensors in the gallery turns off the video and turns on the lights. So the video goes away, and you're left in the presence of, oops. Thank you. You're left in the presence of these locked files that bear the names of different activist groups in the United States that might be under surveillance. So it's a very, very simple interactivity and very legible to the audience. When you open the door and when the gallery is occupied, the video goes away and the lights come on. And as you'll see in a moment, when the gallery is empty, the lights turn back off and the, the video comes back on. So the video can really only be seen from the outside. It can be seen partially and actually in reverse. So I wanted the interactivity to be legible as a symbolic form, to be something that the audience could attempt to, to read, to interpret in some way. And then I have exhibited um, a similar interactive installation at uh, GMK, a gallery in Zagreb, where the main difference was that when the gallery was occupied, the video, which now is on three screens, um, is replaced by these color fields of red, green, and blue. Other than that, it was largely similar. I've also shown dystopia files as a cinematic performance, first at the Cinema de Cineaste in Paris, where I invited a guitarist, Frederick Oberland, to perform an improvisatory uh, instrumental accompaniment to a half an hour long film montage uh, of clips from the archive, and I'll, I'll play that as well. that there are black bands that move slowly across the screen. Those are you know, added to the video as a way of activating it and activating the process of viewing it and also reminding the viewer that this is a, a mediated representation um, and that you're never really seeing the whole picture. This clip here is from uh, Miami in 2002 at the Free Trade Association of America conference. 
This is the birth of what's now become known as the Miami model, where a highly militarized police force creates a secure perimeter around an event and uses less than lethal weapons and massive preemptive arrests to contain and neutralize the protests. And uh, the other aspect of this Miami model is um, intelligence gathering, surveillance, and infiltration of activist groups. So um, the New York City Police Department is really the, the best at this. They have a very large spy service, basically, that um, goes out and, uh, you know, undercover, um, blends in with, mixes with, and um, gets actively engaged in activist organizations, gathers information about them and then targets members for arrest when they show up at, for example, the Republican convention in 2004. But, you know, so, you know, watching this archive, it becomes really clear that everyone here is performing. You know, the protesters are performing. They show up in their protester costumes. The police are performing in their stormtrooper outfits. Um, even the journalists with their cameras are performing. And the whole thing becomes this giant, media spectacle for a distributed media apparatus. You know, everyone brings their cameras. All participants are both performing and producing representations at the same time. So here, you know, my attention is really equally on the protesters and on the, the policing of protests and how this becomes a very complex and theatrical dance. So, and, and the guitarist is there um, in a way to emphasize the performativity of spectatorship. He's watching and performing, clearly performing, you know, performing musically at the same time. And so I've done similar uh, cinematic performances of this project at uh, the Wexner Center and uh, the San Diego Museum of Art. So w as with the Port Huron project, you know, this, the Dystopia Files is, you know, a project with many iterations, many different versions, um, multiple different kinds of installations and, and performances, you know, also single channel videos that can be shown in, in galleries. So next, I, um, I become interested in, well, so having, having looked at how politics were performed on the left end of the political spectrum during the new left movements of the Vietnam era, and then, you know, at, at protest and the policing of protest is kind of, you know, the two, two sides of the political spectrum in a way coming together in public space in the dystopia files. Um, I'm now turning my attention to um, the far right and to the American militia movement. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with it, but in, there's a long history of non-governmental paramilitary activity in the United States, going back to when the United States was a British colony and the American Revolutionary War, and many, many examples throughout the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries, um, with many different um, political valences, not always um, what we would consider today you know, right-wing politics, but uh, in recent years, uh, the, the, the modern militia movement arose in the mid-1990s after federal sieges on um, compounds in Waco, Texas, the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, when the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms laid siege to this religious compound and it ended up um, burning it down and killing a bunch of people. And then also, um, Ruby Ridge in Idaho, where some quote-unquote extremists were holed up with a bunch of weapons and ended up, you know, losing their lives. Um, So-called patriots, um, Americans who lived uh, across the country on the frontiers of rural and suburban uh, zones, 
uh, and who had guns and wanted to keep their guns felt threatened. Uh, police forces, suburban police forces were beginning to encompass their, them and their jurisdictions and these police forces were becoming increasingly heavily armed. You know, this is the rise of the SWAT team and black helicopters and things like that. And, and these, these patriots are getting increasingly paranoid and they start forming militias. And this all came to a head then um, when um, the federal building in, uh, in Oklahoma City was bombed. But anyway, the, this movement has continued and it, uh, it kind of quieted down for a while and then when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, it came back with a vengeance for reasons that I won't speculate on. But um, I formed a collaboration with another artist whose work I admire, um, a Brooklyn artist named Chelsea Knight, and she and I set out to learn more about the militia movement. We made contact with a group in upstate New York, and they invited us after many months of emails and phone conversations and Skyping to come up and film one of their training exercises where they get dressed up in um, military costume, break out their automatic weapons, and engage in paramilitary training. Uh, these guys are, so the, the militia movement is fairly diverse in a way. Um, there are not only uh, white supremacist, uh, neo-Nazi conspiracy freaks, but also somewhat more rational libertarians. These guys fall more on the libertarian end of the spectrum. Um, they seem to be primarily concerned with self-defense in the event of a breakdown of law and order. If civil society collapses due to some kind of sudden economic disaster or environmental catastrophe, they want to be prepared to defend themselves against marauders and to defend their constitutional rights to, to bear arms. So we, we documented one of their training exercises. It happened to snow one March day in 2012. Uh, went back, um, this is the, the group leader's backyard uh, in the suburbs of Rochester. And he's demonstrating here a firing position for us. Um, Chelsea and I then collaborated with uh, different choreographers to translate the maneuvers, uh, firing positions, postures, and formations of the militia training exercises into the more abstract and aestheticized language of dance. Working with a choreographer and dancers in first in St. Louis and then in Paris for an exhibition last summer at the Palais de Tokyo. What I'm going to show you now is a montage of the militia training footage and the dance performances that resulted from these collaborations. So this is what you're gonna do for us to get in that formation, okay? And make sure you guys, uh, when I say do a hand signal or something, you guys do it back to me and then pass it back, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. 
still want to go down on you. Alright, go ahead now. We, we both have to go. Contact left! Contact left! Actually, I'm an AK. You can probably grab it like this right here. Put your hand like that. Yeah. Put your head flat on the ground. Okay. You're gonna push your arm up. Okay. Sweep and pull and push off with your feet. Do not lift your butt or anything. Your head should be getting muddy. Oh yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Good. You don't want that enemy over there to see you. You already look, you high crawled all the way up there, but you gotta stay, keep that head down. You're trying to get up to this covering seal position. You're keeping that muzzle out of, the, out of the dirt, you're doing good. But see how you can, uh, if you have a helmet on, yeah. you can grab your helmet right here, turn your head and peek like that, okay? Mm -hmm. But you wanna keep your head into the dirt. So you, you can grab your helmet and peek, but if you don't have a helmet on, you can just turn your head like this. But you don't want to lift your head like this, because exactly. you're going to get hit more. If you just peek like this, you can see straight ahead where you're going, okay? Hopefully you have friends that are not idiots and they're suppressing for you, so then you can <laughs> high crawl to the whole area, because this takes a long time. Oh, I can right? So how do you get from that position to firing position? From that to a firing position? Yeah. Let's see what you would do. You can do that right there. Uh huh. So over the course of this project, our attention begins to shift. Initially, we were really thinking of dan using dance as a way to draw out the performative qualities of militia training and to, you know, by removing, in a way, the, the trappings, the costumes, and the weapons, um, allow people to see it as a performance without immediately judging it as a kind of lunatic activity. Uh, but as we worked more with dancers, we, the, 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 the focus shifted more towards dance and seeing the militia video as a way of drawing out um, the performative qualities, particularly of rehearsal, but of dance training in general. Both militia training and dance training are, in a certain sense, ways of disciplining the body to perform in certain ways. And both are non-public performative activities where the participants are performing for one another and for their leaders. So what we're doing here at the Pelly to Tokyo is staging a series of rehearsals in the gallery. Uh, we never completed the rehearsals and then had a fini finished dance piece that was performed in repertory, but just kept rehearsing. So um, we've also shown this work as a two-channel video installation in a few different venues, including Optica Center in Montreal, where we've got the militia footage on one screen at one end of the room and the dance footage on the opposite screen, and then sometimes in a corner like this. So working on this project, I became increasingly distracted by the people leaving the room, increasingly interested in <laughs> Okay, all right. All right. If anybody needs to leave, I'll take a, a 30 second break. So I started to get interested by the landscape itself, by these amazing, you know, natural environments where the militia retreat to perform their training exercises. This is a still from the video we shot at the training exercise. Here's a photograph I took uh, that day. You know, landscape as a place where we have always retreated to to project our, our fantasies and desires. 
are ideas about nature and by contrast about our own culture. So I was, you know, I was searching YouTube for uh, militia training videos and found this one. This is just a still from a video uh, from the, the early militia days in the 1990s in the mountains of Wyoming, a training exercise. And I don't know if you remember in the Port Huron project video during the Howard Zinn reenactment, um, I showed a clip from YouTube and it had these recommended videos on the side. I'm sure you're all familiar with how YouTube recommends videos. Well, when I was watching these militia training videos, YouTube would sometimes recommend video game videos. So people who play video games will often record video of their gameplay and post it on YouTube. And the similarities were striking. Um, so here's a screenshot on the left of Ron Cole, this original militia leader from 1997, and on the right from, I think it's Arma. It's a first-person shooter video game. And I thought, you know, aha, video game landscapes. And down the rabbit hole I went. And I started making these large um, landscape photographs in video games. I'm not much of a gamer, but I you know, learned about gaming and got myself uh, a computer specialized for gaming. They call them gaming rigs. You don't usually have to customize them yourself. And it was quite difficult to figure out how to make really large, high resolution pictures that could print big like this. This is about you know, a little less than four by six feet. But I was, I was really uh, fascinated by the role that landscape representations play in these games. S tremendous resources go into producing these immersive, lifelike, lush, painterly, quasi-photographic landscape images that, to me, um, are very reminiscent of 19th century European and American landscape painting. And the work that I'm most familiar with is the Hudson River School paintings of Frederick Church and Asher B. Durand and their colleagues. Landscape as a stage or screen onto which we project ideas about stage onto which I suppose we play out our fantasies. That's what they look like in a gallery. And um, I also made a series of landscape videos, which I will show you now, and I'll close with this. So this is, this is not from a video game. This is from the real world. Uh, this is the militia training ground in upstate New York where I shot that footage on the snowy day. Went back there with a camera. Each of, uh, there are five videos in this series. They're each an hour long. The camera doesn't move. So it's sort of like a, a static moving picture. So, you know, we're, we're living through uh, a moment in history when the long predicted collapse between simulation and reality, between the virtual and the physical, it, it's really becoming palpable. It's happening in our lives in first person shooter video games, in environments like Second Life, um, certainly in social media with things like cyberbullying, um, in drone warfare, where you know, American Air Force pilots basically play video games all day long. Games that actually reach out with Hellfire missiles and kill people. And then, interestingly enough, and this is, this is documented and has been explored by the artist Harun Faroqi, um, the pilots are getting PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, from the experience of killing people by playing games. Um, so, you know, there's this collapse happening. And um, for me, sort of the, at the at the deepest level, that's what this project is exploring. Um, it's how the, the two are becoming increasingly, the two being the virtual and the, and the 
than the physical are becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish. So I'll close with that and I'll leave the video running while uh, I take your questions. Thanks very much for your time. I only know a little bit about their reactions, but um, I will say I got a Facebook message from Nick, the militia leader, when I posted some of these videos on Vimeo, and Vimeo automatically sent an update to Facebook before I turned that feature off, and um, he just said, cool. You know. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that particular group was so open-minded, uh, so welcoming of us. They were very hospitable. They were very protective. They offered to put us up in their houses. We ended up staying in motels. Um, they were very, very careful to make sure we were safe uh, that day when they were firing their, firing their weapons. And um, they, you know, they seemed to trust us at some level. I was very honest with them from the start about you know who I am, and um, it it reminded me of what I imagine it would be like to be an ethnographer doing field work. You know, it was this encounter with the other, you know. And, um, and I think we both kind of got that we were coming from different worlds. And uh, it was interesting in that regard. That was one of the most satisfying aspects of the project for me. I, I don't have a really clear and succinct answer. Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons, um, and there's been a lot of theorizing about it. Um, you know, Slavoj Žižek, among others, has, has written books on the subject. Um, part of it, I think, is simply that there is no longer any apparent viable alternative to neoliberal capitalism, to use some jargony words. Um, you know, in the 1960s, even though I think a lot of people realize that Soviet communism was a joke, there was still an outside to capitalism, um, an outside to American empire, and, uh, or the, the empire of the corporate, you know, of global corporate capital. Um, that no longer seems to exist. Um, part of it, I think, is that um, governments have gotten much better at containing and uh, neutralizing protests in various ways, like creating free speech zones, those pens that you were corralled into. Um, part of it, I think, has to do with changes in the media environment and there, there is no longer a monolithic audience that can be addressed. You know, people bemoaned um, the monolithic control of the media at that time and wished for a day in which every, anyone could have their own TV channel and now we live in that era and we realize that there's a downside to that. Um, you end up with what's known as clicktivism, right? At the same time, I think you know, that those projects, the Port Huron Project and Dystopia Files, addressed an era before Occupy in the Arab Spring. And I think in 2010, we saw the emergence of something new, um, a kind of um, synergistic synthesis of uh, social media and bodies in the street uh, direct action that, you know, although it, you know, it, ended up in some regime changes. It changed the debate in this country. It raised the issue of economic inequality and put it you know, really on the table politically. Um, obviously, we're not living through you know, a revolution. I don't know if anybody in here would even have a clear idea of what revolution would look like or if it would even be desirable. You know, 40 years ago, half the room would have a very clear idea of what revolution looked like and would have believed that it was around the corner. Um, that's the best answer I can give, I think. Yeah, well, you know, when I first I called the curator up and I said, I have this idea, but the gallery's going to be empty. You know, she was a little, you know, she thought the art was going to be in the gallery in some way. Um, but yeah, you know, once I explained the whole concept, she got behind it. it at this point, you know, for example, I'm done with the dystopia files. I'm happy to exhibit it, and I would basically recreate one of the iterations and maybe modify it to some extent. Like those interactive installations need to be site specific at some level, unless, you know, unless a venue is willing to go to great lengths to construct glass doors and things like that. 
Uh, in New York City, I put casting calls in Backstage, which is a weekly that's read by a lot of actors and where a lot of people run casting calls. Rented a, you know, a casting space. There are dozens of them within a few blocks of here. And uh, you know, so you put a cast, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing about living in New York. You put a, an ad in Backstage, you'll get hundreds of headshots and <laughs> have your choice of people to uh, audition. And um, I did pay them, but uh, you know, all of you students who are looking for performers for your projects, there are hundreds of actors who would be thrilled to work with you. So yeah, so I, I cast, I didn't cast them for resemblance. I didn't look for people who looked like the historical figures, although the Howard Zinn actor looked a lot, lot like a young Howard Zinn by coincidence. I looked for actors who I felt could deliver a great speech in their own voice. I never played recordings for them if I had them. They weren't trying to impersonate the original speakers. Um, I looked for actors who seemed to really get the content of the speeches, and it's usually because they had some personal experience. Like the, the speaker who, uh, the actor who gave the did the credit cut Scott King reenactment is herself a single mom uh, living in the housing projects just uh, south and west of here. Um, and she really connected with some of the themes in that speech. Um, uh, Atoa Sando, who did Stokely Carmichael, had himself a long history of activism and is also a terrific actor. If you've seen um, Copper, the BBC America show, he plays the doctor on that show now. Um, and the, the one, a uh, performer who was not a professional actor uh, reenacted the Cesar Chavez speech. That's Ricardo Dominguez, who is a performance artist and new media artist and a professor at UC San Diego and an old friend of mine. That's, it, it's, a, it's a good question that, that is Im important, I think, to, to address. I, I make a distinction between political art and art about politics. And I, um, I like to think that what I'm making is the latter. I'm not trying to affect change through my work. I don't think that my work is going to swing a vote or like Errol Morris's documentary, Thin Blue Line, get somebody off of death row. Um, I would say Thin Blue Line is a really good example of political art. Um, and, and there are many others. Um, if the Port Huron project were um, political art, I might have really worked with activist organizations to use the reenactments as events to recruit uh, participants, uh, to organize the people that were there, to have them participate in discussions and workshops afterwards. Um, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't socially engaged art in that sense. And not all socially engaged art is political art either, but you know, it was, it's more art about politics. For me, it's a, a meditation and exploration of questions of how politics are performed and how those performances are mediated and represented and understood. Yeah, that was really challenging. Uh, and, um, you know, I used flyers, posters, um, word of mouth networks, email lists, social media. Um, the first three re reenactments I did more or less independently. Um, and then I, um, Creative Time, which is a non-for-profit arts organization here in New York that focuses on what they call art in the public realm. They produced and presented the last three events and helped me partner with, for example, in Oakland, the Oakland Museum of California, in Los Angeles with LACE. And having a partnership with an institution or two really helped um, get people to, to turn out. The audience was a mix of art world people, uh, activist types and passers-by. But almost everybody there came to hear the reenactment, as far as I could tell. It wasn't because of budget limits. Car Park was basically a no-budget project. Um, yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of spectacle in the Port Huron project in the reenactments themselves, in the screening in Times Square, and things like that. Um, there's this uh, term that I've heard that I don't fully understand, uh, counter spectacle. The idea of producing a spectacle that works as a kind of like a media jam, 
to thwart the logic of spectacle um, as a kind of economy of signs. I'm not going to make those claims about my work. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't consciously moved away from producing spectacle. It's an astute observation, though. What we were trying to do was create, um, well, a social experiment that would transform that community's experience of the institution in the park, space of the parking lots for a day to transform it into a totally weird world, as one woman put it. Um, where people were encouraged to cooperate instead of competing and produce this, um, this aesthetic experience together, um, and at the same time produce a massive media spectacle with, you know, we had television news helicopters circling the campus all day long. The president of the college was flying journalists over the campus in his small plane. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were on local news and national TV in Mexico, and I was going for that at that time. It was exciting to me, and I wanted to have kind of maximum impact and have this, you know, these concentric circles of audience, you know, the people who were experiencing it firsthand, and then people who would see it, you know, on TV, and then people who might, you know, read about it or hear someone talk about it at some point. I, I guess for me, it, it's about. Um, a lot of different layers. It's a, it's a loose metaphor, but um, the rare earth theory is basically the theory that the conditions that arose on this planet that led to life and biodiversity in this incredibly lush environment, that these conditions are rare, um, therefore particularly precious, that the efflorescence of virtual worlds is arising at a time when the you know, physical natural environment is disappearing before our eyes. Um, also, I just feel like these new earths, these new natural environments and landscapes that are being produced in these virtual worlds are rare as in strange, kind of. Um, it's like a, you know, rare, a rarefied, uh, special, strange, surreal. Um, uncanny earth, in a way. OK, well, it's almost 20 past 8. I guess we should wrap up. Um, I'll be happy to take other questions afterwards. Thanks.